This past summer, we completed our maiden or first ever drill program at this van target. And over the last sort of uh, two months or so, we've been putting out news releases describing a major new discovery at this van target. So the, the drilling to date has returned some of the strongest intercepts of nickel that we've ever had in the project's history. The Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. The Financial Survival Network. Welcome back. I'm Kerry Lutz, your host of Financial Survival Network. We are here with Martin Turin. Martin, you are CEO of FPX Nickel, and we wanted to get a sponsor update. We've got news of high grade nickel drill results, we've got enhanced recoveries, a whole lot more. But First, we'll talk about uh, metals markets because that's what it all comes down to. Martin, welcome back. Gary, it's uh, great to see you again and great to speak to your listeners as well. So obviously, demand is what commodities prices are all about and supply. And in this case, we're looking at commodity prices going up. Uh, When I compare the nickel chart against the uh, copper chart for the past six months, the past year, past five years. They are incredibly bullish formations there. Uh, Some technical analysts would refer to them as making a massive cup with a handle. Whether you buy into technical analysis or not, they are making higher highs and higher lows. That is always a bullish sign. Yeah, the nickel price has been performing very well this this year. Um, had a bit of a hiccup in the first quarter, but has been pretty much steadily moving upwards. And where we're really seeing that, uh, and the kind of the basis for that, is just really, really strong uh, demand for nickel this year. We're seeing that 2021, the year-over-year demand growth, will be something in the range of 15%. Now, granted, that's off a relatively low base from 2020, given the impacts of, uh, of everything we saw globally health-wise last year. Um, but what's really exciting is I think people are, are forecasting that demand growth will continue to be very, very strong going forward. And where that's translating in the physical market for nickel is into significant drawdowns of nickel inventories at both the London warehouse and the Shanghai warehouses. Um, so every day, it's not uncommon to see another one or 2,000 tons of nickel getting sucked out of those inventories. That's a considerable amount. I mean, nickel trades for, you know, in the ballpark of $20,000 a ton. So every time that, that amount of net volume is coming out day after day, week after week, month after month, it's pointing to real physical tightness in the market. And that is what is causing this sort of an increase in the nickel price, you know, Always worthwhile mentioning, though, that at $9 a pound or so right now, uh, nickel is trading for well below its all-time high in the last cycle, which which hit, hit a peak of around $24 a pound. So uh, leave it to everyone's imagination as to where they think the nickel price could go forward in a world where you know more and more people are driving electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. As well as yours truly. And so the supply side, uh, new projects coming on, not a lot of new projects, and but there's a lot of talk about new projects. Well, yes and no. <clears throat> Any of the new nickel supply over the last many years and really in the next few years has been and will continue to be in the short term almost exclusively from Indonesia. So Indonesia has become the kind of the Saudi Arabia, if, if you will, of the nickel business. Uh, with all of the risk that that kind of comparison sort of implies, um, particularly when you consider that Indonesia really is only producing that nickel supply to the benefit of, of China. So China, the Chinese uh, financial interests have taken a dominant position in Indonesian nickel production. And very few other outside companies, non-Chinese companies, are able to participate in that. So that means that all that nickel supply is really going into Chinese hands. The rest of the world, Europe, North America, has to really look for its nickel from other places. You know, and, and there's a way in which they can't even really take that Indonesian nickel supply. It tends to be very dirty. It tends to have very high carbon emissions associated with nickel production. So if you wanted to take nickel into an EV battery, you're not going to want to take it from those dirty sources, places like Indonesia. You're going to have to look elsewhere to projects uh, in North America or in Australia. 
you know, and that's where a company like FPX fits in with our product uh, in central BC on, on the West coast of Canada. We think for ESG and other reasons, there's going to be a real premium to be placed on um, nickel project development, you know, in parts of the world like North America and Australia, where, um, you know, North American and, and European uh, battery makers and, and car makers are, are, are going to feel safer about their supply chains in that respect. Yeah, and you had mentioned before that the nickel coming out of uh, Baptiste and potentially out of Van, uh, very clean, requires no smelting. So cost advantage wise, as opposed to dirtier sources, uh, you certainly have an advantage. Yeah, the nickel business is a is a bit of a tough business, I think, for newcomers to understand. You know, quite simply, you have the mining companies, then uh, in often case you'll have the sort of the smelters and refiners sitting as the middleman, and then you'll have the un- end customers, let's say the automakers or the stainless steel producers. Um, and the unique mineralization that we have at our Baptiste project is such that we can cut out that middleman. We produce a very clean product that doesn't require any cut, any smelting and can therefore find a much readier, easier path to those end customers. And that means significantly higher top line revenue or what's called payability in the mining business for our nickel product versus typical nickel products. So that unique mineralogy in our case uh, serves a real advantage from a downstream uh, revenue standpoint. Yeah, And you mentioned that this is exactly the type of nickel that Elon Musk is mandating for Tesla batteries and vehicles. Well, I, I, I haven't said that. I wouldn't go quite so far as to say that exactly. But uh, I would say that, you know, when Tesla does talk about wanting to have a more efficient path from the mine to the battery, um, they are talking about trying to cut out some of those intermediary smelting and refining steps to the extent it's possible and sort of disrupting that supply chain and finding clever ways of shortening the path between the mine and, and, the, and the battery. And we think given the unique mineralization at our deposit, we have that natural endowment to be able to do just that, whether uh, it's for uh, electric vehicle battery use or, or stainless steel use in a way that, again, cuts, cuts down on the number of refining stages. Right. And besides that, recently, I saw a release from FPX saying that you've managed to up your recoveries by 5%. That's, that's very meaningful, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. So the um, the preliminary economic assessment that we did on our Baptiste project in 2020 assumed that we achieve recoveries of 85% of the nickel in the host rock. And so we'd be losing about 15% of the nickel through the process of recovery. The more recent test work that we've done at, at a scaled up, scaled up level, at a pilot scale, uh, has demonstrated we have a recovery potential closer to 90%. Um, so about 5% higher than uh, what we estimated in the PEA. And, um, and so that, to your point, that is very significant. So we estimate that for every percentage point increase in nickel recovery, that adds approximately $56 million US uh, to the after-tax NPV of the project. So if we're able to realize that full 5 percentage point increase in uh, in, in recovery, you're looking at something north of $250 million of additional you know, project value that's been crystallized through these test results. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's very exciting for us. And, and I think something that, that we, we want to make sure investors are aware of. Oh, for sure. That's, that's uh, major money there. Almost another $300 million NPV. And recently you got back results on the van project, and those were highly encouraging. That's right. So the, the I would suggest the valuation of FPX has been back to date by uh, what we have at our Baptiste deposit. Uh, Baptiste is the third largest undeveloped nickel deposit in the world, and it could be one of the largest nickel mines in the world when it's put into operation. Uh, we've put out an, a project study on that, the, the preliminary economic assessment that I mentioned earlier, that estimated um, a net present value well in excess of uh, one $1.7 billion US for that project alone. Uh, That project, we're now moving into the next stage into preliminary feasibility study towards an ultimate sort of construction decision in the years to come. Uh, Six kilometers north or about five, four miles rather north of uh, Baptiste 
is another target, another very large uh, target for nickel mineralization, which we call VAN. We had previously delineated that as a target on the basis of uh, nickel coming to surface in bedrock, right, right, right to surface in outcrop as a very large target. This past summer, we completed our maiden or first ever drill program at this van target. And over the last sort of uh, two months or so, we've been putting out news releases describing a major new discovery at this van target. So the, the drilling to date has returned some of the strongest intercepts of nickel that we've ever had in the project's history. And importantly, those stronger nickel grades are occurring right near surface. And so that's suggesting to us that the thesis that we've had all along that van could be a larger and or higher grade deposit compared to what we already have at Baptiste. That thesis has very much been preserved and confirmed in, in these initial drill results. We will have more drill results to report to the market as we turn the calendar here to 2022 as well. So watch the space. I, I find it kind of amazing. There's all this value in this company and yet the market has uh, kind of just not caught wind of it yet. Yeah, there's a real disconnect between, at one level, what we see in the nickel price, which, as we mentioned, has been very strong. At another level, what we see in our engagement with uh, strategic counterparties. So these are large mining companies, uh, you know, some of the major companies, as well as counterparties in the battery supply chain in North America. So car makers, battery makers, et cetera. And the high degree of interest that these groups have in our project versus what we see in the equity capital markets, where... Um, you know, this is still the mining business is still a bit of a sleepy space, right? It's still slept on, so to speak, by the vast majority of investors. We saw in the last month or so the IPO by Rivian, for example, which has been sort of spectacular. Rivian is now one of the most highly valued car companies in the world with fairly modest, you know, car sales or vehicle sales to date. Um, you look at the kind of the valuation the equity capital markets are affording to companies like that. Then you look at companies like FPX um, and other, other juniors that are developing strong projects. We see a fundal di fundamental disconnect. And at some point, we know that the market will kind of catch up to that. Uh, but for the time being, it still seems to me to be kind of a contrarian play, but one in the context of a strong commodity backdrop and the next several years of, of likely kind of um, uh, supply deficits in some of these key commodities that should support these, these equities going forward. Well, the news from FBX has pretty much been positive all the way along. Every hole you drilled in Van came up with mineralization. All the uh, all the aspects of Baptiste are in place. Is it going to take a supply crunch till the world kind of wakes up, the investing world, and says, "Wait, where is this company been all the time? We've been looking for the FPX. Where has it been?" I think, frankly, you're going to start to see capital getting deployed into these types of companies by some of those strategic groups that I mentioned earlier, whether it's the mining companies or whether it's, in fact, the car makers and the battery makers. There, there is a real scramble to bring new nickel projects to the point of being able to, to kind of supply this burgeoning demand um, over the next several years. And so there's a way in which I think one of the key catalysts for a stock like this could be that kind of uh, strategic investment. And, um, you know, uh, ideally, you'll want to own, you know, um, companies like this the day, the day before that type of announcement is made as opposed to the day after. Yeah. Well, one day, uh, nickel is a blasé investment. Nobody cares about it. And then all of a sudden, everybody realizes one day, if we don't have nickel, we don't have batteries, we don't have stainless steel, it's, it's all these applications which are required for modern life, and we don't have enough nickel, and there's not enough coming into the supply chain to really satisfy the future demand. So I find FPX is really, its thesis, its reason for being highly timely and highly relevant, and hopefully the, the market's gonna catch on until one day they wake up and it'll pass them by. Yeah, the other thing to mention too is you've got real sort of political will, which is now starting to be marshaled in support of this movement as well, right? You're seeing the Biden administration make these strong proclamations on wanting to have, I believe, 50% of new car sales in the United States be EVs by the year 2030. 
that number I think is currently in the range of one to 2%. So over the next nine years, there's going to be a huge shift in transport, a huge shift in the amount of nickel required. And, um, you know, all the, all the big three U S automakers, all their CEOs are making very bold pronouncements about how well positioned they are to uh, electrify their fleets in the years to come. And, and, uh, you're right. None of this will happen without nickel. Um, and it, none of this will happen without projects like FPX's kind of coming to, to, uh, to construction and to production here, hopefully before the end of the decade. Oh, for sure. I mean, it just reminds me, Martin, back in world war two, the U.S. stopped minting five-cent nickels with nickel. They actually used silver instead, silver and copper, because they needed the nickel to build ships, battleships, for the for the steel to, uh, you know, strengthen the steel. And I think we'll know we're there when they finally uh, say, all right, we're just going to use zinc for nickels, no more copper, no more nickel. It's going to be made out of zinc. But... Maybe that day is uh, sooner ahead than we ever thought, Martin. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, we won't let the zinc CEOs hear, hear that too too loudly there. They, they probably have an argument to say zinc's going to go up as well. Um, but you're right. There's there's a lot of, I think, it's, it's you know, this entire movement towards greater nickel consumption is being driven by, on the one hand, industry, uh, the auto industry. Um, it's also being driven by governments, as we just mentioned. And it's being driven by consumers as well. You know, for anyone out there who has driven an EV, owns an EV, or even knows someone who owns an EV, those those people they tend to be zealous in their in their love of their electric vehicles, and so there's something about that consumer experience as well that we need to kind of bear in mind as as a key driver for this for this shift to electric vehicles as well. And there's another trend that we didn't even talk about. I'll just mention it as an aside. But the new Tesla Cybertruck, for which there's close to a million pre-orders, is going to have a stainless steel skin. So it needs yet more nickel. Now, whether that's a trend or not, obviously stainless steel exterior is heavier, but much more rigid, less prone to corrosion. I don't know that that's a trend. But if it becomes a trend as well, then the nickel price could really be supercharged. Yeah, that's right. And at any rate, it just looks really cool to have a stainless steel clad uh, 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 construction there. And, and stainless has all kinds of really wonderful applications in architecture as well. Some of my favorite uh, buildings, uh, certainly in the States, I think of the Disney Concert Hall in, in uh, downtown Los Angeles, which is clad in stainless steel. It's a beautiful building material. Yeah, absolutely. So there could be a lot of surprises or additional upside surprises we're not even thinking about right at this particular moment. So I find the whole case for nickel intriguing. Uh, nickel, copper commodities have been on a tear, no question about it. So you're going to want to go over to fpxnickel.com, sign up for notifications. So that way, as soon as Martin finds out something, you'll find out as well ticker symbols uh, in Canada, FPX, in the US, FPOCF. And if you've got any questions for Martin, just shoot me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com. Martin, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kerry. Great to chat with you again. The Financial Survival Network.